All right, I want to introduce you again to Tim Ballard. He's the founder and CEO of Operation Underground Railroad. Joining him, first time on television, first time being outed here, Dutch Chorley. He is a former Navy SEAL and undercover operative and uh, no longer going to be doing that. You're going to be behind the scenes now so his face can be seen. And Mark Mabry, an old friend from the Blaze and uh, worked with me for a long time. He was in Columbia with Tim as a, a freelance journalist. Welcome back. How are you? Thank you. It's great to be here. Good. Um, we're going to get to your story here in a second because you wrote a story. It will be posted uh, at glenbeck.com by the end of the show. This I'm asking you to go get and spread it and, and give it to everybody you know. It will tell this story in an unbelievable um, way. Um, but let's hear it from you guys um, from the beginning. What, what amazed me was you brought in... Um, you, 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 you made a list, and it was like the old auction block of what these little girls will do. And you said, what was the, what was the, the, um, the story? That you were a bunch of businessmen, or you were bringing in a bunch of businessmen? That's right. We met these, uh, these traffickers. Um, well, there's, there's three operations going on separately. Uh, the one that I was at, Dutch was in Medellin, and he can talk about that. I was, uh, I, I met these traffickers, this, this group, <clears throat> in, uh, in these, the Rosario Islands, which is uh, a, a place that people don't even know, they don't even know it exists. And I was asked by uh, the Colombian prosecutors, will you go check this out? Check this island out. We've heard things. We haven't really checked it out. Go there. Within a half hour of being there, uh, we're, we're approached and, and solicited. I have 10, 11, 12-year-old girls. Would you, would you like, are you interested? And I thought to myself, this is one of these places where these guys have been working with impunity for decades. And people from America and, and Western Europe, these travelers, they know about it. They go there, which is why tell it was so easy. These guy, tell me who these guys are. Because you had to have studied them somewhat because you have to nail them. So you have to, you have to, in, oh, you have to right. impersonate them. So who are they? The guys who travel. Yeah, because the Americans. They, you know what? You think about this. There's two million children being exploited commercially for sex. So what kind of demand would that create? There are so many people that want this that it's, it's something that I know it's, it's hard to, to, to understand. But it's anybody. It's everybody. It's teachers, doctors, lawyers, you know, people that, that walk amongst us. And they, they have this sex addiction. And they just they, they, they start growing it. It stems from, from poor news. And it, it becomes an addiction that grows out of control. And these guys end up wanting to buy 10-year-old boys and girls. And boys were on this, too. They were selling us boys, these traffickers. I got a um, note from you that talked about negotiating for them. You want to tell that? There was, this was, uh, yeah, I mean, we sit, we sit across from these traffickers, and uh, they, they talk about, children being abused in this way like they're talking about the weather like they're selling you a car and they're very specific this 10 year old girl will do x y and z this 11 year old girl will do x y and z i have virgins for you that we've been preparing we've been grooming them for for a year or more and and we're going to deliver them to you and your party for a thousand dollars and they at one point they bring they bring the kids out this is before they're going to be liberated and and, um, and, and these kids were, they were crying. And uh, that's something that I almost, I almost, I think I told you, I, I don't know if I'm just in this too, too long. I, I, it was the first time that I started to, I felt like I was breaking character. I felt tears forming. I thought, okay, I'm, I'm going to be the van guy now. I'm, I'm ready to be in, be in the van. And, um, and uh, I don't know how you, I'm going to be man to man here. I don't know how you don't want to just kill them all. I mean, you're a Navy SEAL. You know you could kill them all. Um, uh, how, how do you, because it would just, I, I, you know, Mark has gone with, said it's the first time that you really felt like a man. You felt like a righteous man when you Absolutely. went. I don't know. I don't think I could handle it. I, I think I would, I, I think I'd grab somebody's gun and just shoot them all. What I do is, uh, is just think. I, I have those feelings. And I think if I, if I mess up now, these guys might not end up for the rest of their lives in jail. And that's the thing that keeps me going. Dutch, what do you, how do you do it? What do you do? Dutch, well, I've seen Dutch when, kind of walk out a couple times in <laughs> the room, I think. 
When I first started uh, doing this with Tim, um, we talked about this. We talked about the importance uh, that you know we needed to play these roles so that these guys could could be taken down, so that these kids could be saved. If we made a mistake and we went out of character, I mean, how many kids would just go right back into the sex slavery? You know, and and we failed them. And so, as we keep that vision, as we keep the vision of being able to rescue these these kids, that's that's what we hold on to, and and we don't let our anger, you know, about what they are doing, you know, get in front of us. And you know, it's very important to control our emotions and and keep the end game in front of us the whole time. How do you do it? How do you just keep it in check? I have the luxury of having a camera there, so I've got an outlet. So how are you? But how are you getting away with the? How's he getting away with the camera? What's your cover? Um, from the second uh, on this one, the second I met the bad guys and we met them at the dock, I was like, "Hey, man, selfie!" I was taking pictures of everything with my iPhone. And they're posing, they're smiling, they're laughing. Oh yeah, it's a party to them. So. And then, and then I go, I graduate up to this little silver camera I bought at Costco or something. And then by the end, I'm like, before we hopped on the boat, it's like, "You got to see my camera at the house." And they just figure I'm, I'm a freak who wants to take pictures of the kids. And so, mm. first thing we did, I ran into my room. I'm like, look at this thing. It's this big professional camera that I've shot with for years. And um, I take a picture of the bad guy. He waves and smiles. I say, geez, show him it on the back the whole time I'm taking pictures. We had, so one, guy, established. We had one guy in one of the cities, Glenn, who, who actually offered to bring cameras to, to make so we could leave with child pornography that, that he made with us. Oh, my gosh. So, I mean, that, that's, that's how these guys have been operating with impunity. That's the point. We, they're, they're, they're the response, that's what we're, we're trying to bring, a, a powerful response. So who, who, well, before I get into um, the children, first of all, tell me about this operation. Went down three at, a, three, three at the same time. That's right. Three different operations. That's right. Biggest in the history of, of uh, I've never, sex I, ring, right? I've never heard of any of, of something this big. Okay. Um, you, they come in, they bust everybody. This is the first time something kind of went wrong. I mean, I think it was honestly a gift to you, myself, but something went wrong. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I, the, the one, one, of the, um, one regret that I often have is that I get taken away in these operations in handcuffs, and the kids see me, and they think, he's that monster, I'm so glad he's, he's leaving, and, and I want to tell them, no, we were here for you, but we never, I've never been able to do that. Um, on this operation, um, when the family services came in, and we had great cooperation, I, I, I need to give credit to the Colombian government and to the U.S. government and the embassy who came in and helped us in a big way. Wow. Too. Unbelievable support there. Um, that is really, there's not a lot of positive, you know, coming out of our governments right now. It's good to see that. Oh, and like, Ambassador Whitaker, U.S. Ambassador to Colombia, unbelievable. Just everything he could do. Great. to help us. And these people want to do so much good and they, their intentions are so good but sometimes you know the red tape just doesn't allow it to, sure. to happen. You know? um, and so as we were, uh, um, as the dust was settling, someone accidentally in the family services I, I assume told the kids those Americans out there were actually they're good guys. They were posing as bad guys to, to rescue you. And, <clears throat> and as we were walking out, marching out to the boats to be taken away, the kids, we were alerted they knew who we were. And it was the first time I'd seen this. And these, these kids come running to the window. And they put their little hands up on the screen of the window. And for the first time in my life, I got to see this, see, see them really experience their liberation. The jump team, I remember behind me, he just started weeping, just, just sobbing. He grabbed me and said, Tim, this is, this is the sound of liberation. They were, the kids were cheering. And singing, and and I put my hand up against this little girl's hand, and we both smiled at each other, and it was um, it was a tender mercy, it was a gift, I think. This is the last time I'm going undercover, and uh, we got to witness emancipation. Back in a minute. 